Right, okay. So back at the July virtual ABUG event, Paul Fellows gave a talk about his career at Acornsoft running the languages team. He discussed some products that we weren't familiar with, which rather piqued our interest, including some variants of BBC Basic. More recently, Stuart Swales, also from the Acornsoft languages group and later Acorn Computers, gave a talk at the monthly Rugol event. And during the QA, I took the opportunity to quit him about any development versions or even source code that he might still have backups for, for products that he worked on during his time at Acorn. So both Paul and Stuart have been going through their old hard drives, backups, collections of floppies, etc. And it's no exaggeration to say that they've uncovered some real treasure. Now, over the past week or so, there's been a real flurry of activity amongst the Stardot community as we've gone through code, fix things up and prepare them for distribution so that all of this software and firmware that you're about to hear about, which we'd assumed had been lost to the mists of time, can now be shared, downloaded, hopefully en masse, and therefore preserved. So both Paul and Stuart join us today, along with John Thackeray, who took over development of the BBC operating system ROM, and Hugo Tyson, who bug fixed the Acorn DFS ROM, to version 1.20 and is probably more well known for writing ADFS which was of course the filing system used to drive the original Acorn Winchester hard drives on the BBC Micro and ADFS is what went on to become the core filing system in the Archimedes and RISCOS machines. So if we rewind back to the late 90s when Acorn computers were disbanded the RISCOS source code that I believe was passed across to PACE wasn't complete there were some components missing, including sources for 65 Host. 65 Host was the BBC Micro emulator that was bundled on the RISCOS 2 and later RISCOS 3 application disks. Well, the sources for both 65 Host and also 65 Tube have now been located. 65 Tube being the 6502 coprocessor emulator that was packaged along with 65 Host. When we had a look through it all, we not only found the sources for 65 host and 65 tube, but also 65 turbo, which emulated what was known internally among Acorn as the turbo tube, an enhanced version of the 6502 second processor that featured 256k RAM, and it was used to assemble versions of the BBC MOS ROM. So not only have we located the little known turbo tube emulator, we've got the source for it too. As we dug deeper into the 65 host bundle of files, we couldn't believe it when we discovered what appeared to be the original commented source code for version 1.2 of the BBC Micro OS ROM. Now at first we feared that the source code would be for the modified version of the OS ROM that had been hacked to support the Archimedes keyboard, but after checking through the sources we found that back in 1988 or whenever it was, Stuart had the foresight to include build options so we can choose to assemble either the original BBC Micro OS ROM or the version featuring the modifications required for it to run on the Archimedes within the 65 host emulator. So this is just magnificent news because obviously a couple of months back a user called Toby Lobster created and uploaded a fully disassembled reassembled assembly of the OS ROM and now to complement that, we have the original commented source. Firstly, Phil Pemberton is going to show us the build process for 65 host and the Bebo SROM using RISCOS. Then we'll move on to looking at some of the 8-bit sources, which we've packaged up in such a way that they can easily be assembled on an actual or emulated BBC Micro. This will also include the various BBC basic sources that were provided by Paul Fellows as well as the source for Hugo's DFS, the Tube ROM, Turbomasm, and more. Now we have to credit Dave Banks, who's known as Hoglet amongst the community. He's worked tirelessly over the last few days to neatly bundle up all of the 8-bit content into various distributions via GitHub. Ditto for Peter Flibble, who, like Dave, has been working flat out, testing, fixing, and documenting the build process under RISCOS which Phil is now going to take us through. We'll share the links towards the end of this presentation, but for now, over to you, Phil. 
on my left, as you've seen there, I've got the instructions sat on four cone. Um, and on my right, I've got a fairly standard RISCOS 4 install of RPCMU. So this is slightly different to what the instructions have for you, uh, which uses the RISCOS 3.71 Easy Start bundle. Practically very little difference. So we need to install a couple of files to begin with. Uh, we've got AASM, which is the Acorn Macro Assembler. I have a nice copy there already installed in my library directory. Next, I need to unzip a copy of the RISCOS 2 headers into the root directory of my drive. So that's straight there. And finally, we have 6502goodies.zip, which has two directories containing the source code to 65 hosts and the MOS. Um, there is one more thing I need from the RISCOS 2 apps disk, which is the released version 0.97 of 65 host. So that's everything we need there. Um, there are some small modifications that need to be made to the code. So this is as it came right off of, uh, what I assume right off of the network in Acorn uh, when it was archived. So the file types for some of the files have gone. So I need to go into this MU6502 new emulate. And we have a couple of build scripts here which need to be set typed to obey. So we can actually run those. We need a couple of directories, uh, image and, come on, and rm to put the output files into. And I'm just going to, where's the other one? There's also the BBC hosted files. And copy for host. Okay, so it's actually in host MUOS. So we need to grab a pre built version of the 1.2 BBC OS ROM, and that needs to go into new emulate. And we'll also need the tube OS, which goes into the same place. My directory window starts to get quite large. So we need those, obviously, for the emulator to actually load uh, and execute at runtime. Without the OS and the tube OS, we can't really do much. It's not really a BBC emulation. So there's some slight changes that need to be made to the other build scripts. So host, we need to tell it to load a different, initially it tries to load this over a network share. So we just tell it to glue our OS 1.2 ROM into the emulator. Do the same again for the tube version. We have the tube version of the OS and we just save that. And we'll patch the turbo version as well. And again, this is a version of the tube OS just running on hardware, which has significantly more RAM than the standard 6502 second processor. Uh, so that's for glue files. We need to make a few small changes to the emulator source code itself uh, to fix some compile issues. Emulate MU body. So we need to go to line 302. Someone's going to tell me at the end that there is a uh, <laughs> a jump to line number command. Press in. function five. Yeah, oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Peanut <laughs> Gallery. Um, so what we need to do is move this outside of the conditional block. So I'm just going to do block process move, and it magically appears there. And just to be pedantic, I'll add a blank line above it for mm -hmm. cleanliness. So that's fixing a compilation error in the code as we get it, and a fallen foul of 
65 of uh, strong ads uh, trying to save that out as a block, but oh, it works anyway. MU tube needs just to make you happy, I will uh, use F5. Uh, MU tube line 26. Where to execute it needs some capitals. Save that. Uh, MU tube line 221. And again, we've got where to execute it again. And then last, where to execute it just below that. Again, same change. Just add some capital letters. And that's case sensitive. So that is the sum total of the changes that we need. I need a task window next to build this thing. So if I'd thought ahead, I'd have created an obey file with a single letter name to do that. Build the 65 host. Build the 65 tube. That's not right. That's called a spelling mistake. Okay, line 26. Let's, let's do this properly. <sighs> I think what happened there that. is that when EASM was rewritten in C, it became a bit case sensitive. Mm, possibly. So, this should work. Yeah. is exactly right. There we go. So, we have the 65 tube emulator built. And we'll build. The when I type the right command. We'll build the turbo tube emulator as well, which has support for the 256K uh, second processor. So everything built correctly, which it has, we can see the directory output there at the end of the build saying, you know, we've got the today's date on it, um, free emulation modules back in the MU. For some reason now Zoom is streaming, it's missing characters on the keyboard, but that's okay, I'll deal with it like a true professional. So if I double click these modules, I'll do 65 Turbo first because I know how to quit that. We have the Turbo Tube emulator there. We have 65 Tube. And we have 65 host, which will completely take over the screen. And annoyingly, I can't quit this with star quit. Also, I can't type into it. Ah, hmm. It's all right. We can kill it with alt break. Good old risk -os. So the problem we have here is that uh, 65 host requires a modified version of the um, BBC OS to uh, change some of the keyboard hooks. Otherwise, we have that problem. The keyboard just doesn't work. So this requires a, a bit of a uh, bit of work too. So we have the... What we need to do is copy the... We need to copy the Turbo Macro Assembler from the BBC library directory. Uh, looking at whatever else is in there is left as an exercise to the reader. So we want to get out of new emulate and back into the root directory there. And host MU OS is the emulator. This is the virtual directory that we're going to use inside the emulator to build things. 
So I need host MUOS. So I just need to copy that in there as I'm not comfortable running this emulator now it's done that. So I'll just reset this. I assume 65 host has clobbered something that Riscos needs. But that's okay, we can carry on. Uh, BBC Winnie and MU6502, right. So, grab the macro assembler and copy that in there. Inside host MUOS, we need a directory called X, which is hiding right at the end there. Host MUOS, we have the MOS header, and we need to just change that GBLL to have a dollar sign in front of it. Uh, make MOS. going to be up at the top. Make MOS. This line here with the number 74, you need to change that to number 76. I'll leave it for Flibble to tell you why that is. So again, pop into a task window. I'll just size this to fit neatly at the bottom there. We load the 65 turbo emulator into memory and we now have the turbo emulator running under our PC emulator. So we have an emulator running inside an emulator where meta emulating, it's emulator section. So 6502 host and we have the MOS source code sat inside the 65 tube 256K emulator, and we're going to build Yes, the MOS, that'd be a good idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna spell it correctly at some point. So we've built the uh, OS 1.2. Unfortunately, we can't quit out of this in any conventional form. Uh, exit doesn't work, star quit doesn't work, so I'm just going to go, oh, okay, that doesn't work either. So I'm just going to quit the emulator. Uh, so we now have a file MOS1 underscore 20 here, which is our 1.2 uh, emulator. So I'm going to do... I would love it if it actually didn't miss characters. That's getting slightly annoying. We're in the same directory we were before. So I'm going to do... And I'll make the host MUOS. Where is that hiding? Make host should generate a file host OS. So we have host OS, which is the 1.2 operating system built for 65 host. And if I go into MU6502, new emulate, we can now combine our newly built operating system. It's for glue file, isn't it? Yes. Can now build. Now change that from OS 120 to host OS. Check that's spelt correctly. Grab another task window for this. Get out of host MUOS and into, no, sorry, I need to be in. Uh, 
new emulate and ek host. So again, we build 65 host with the host OS. And if I go, I'm not going to start this at the moment because I would like to have the ARFS uh, module so I can quit to 65 host the normal way and access the host file system. So BBC Win8 library. Turbo Massum into ARFS Turbo Oops. Emulated 6502 AFS, and we'll put Turbo Massum in there. And again, we create the X directory for the temporary files. So I'm the, I've already RM loaded the turbo emulator, so you can load turbo emulator again. Hop into the AF directory and build it really doesn't like backspace. Right. For once, we didn't have to make any changes and it just built. So we have the AFs ROM there. So what we can do now is take our 65 host application, get rid of the run image, get rid of AFs, pop in our ready built AFs, go back up a few directories, grab the emulator, which is rm.65host, copy that in as pling run image, fire up 65 host, And we can now see the ARFS build directory, which was the current selected directory, uh, when we started the emulator. And I'll just drop into the root directory, and you can see the entire contents of my RISC PC root directory. Um, and we can run the emulator. So there are some caveats for backspace keys you saw a second ago, doesn't quite work correctly, but delete key works fine. Um, you also saw a second ago uh, me catting the, uh, the current file system. It defaults to booting to DFS instead of ARFS. So type ARFS and you can browse the uh, local file system. Um, changing mode causes the emulator to crash out. Yeah, it doesn't like risk PCs, does it? Oh, well. But there you go. We can run BBC software for the uh, standard BBCB, the BBCB with a tube, or indeed the Acorn special internal 256K second processor, which was have been seen by very few people outside of Acorn. So just briefly, there's an absolute ton of stuff in the BBC library directory, which I'll leave you to explore yourselves. Yeah, I noticed one thing in there, which was yep. you've got Turbo 816, which is, as John will tell us, the assembler for the 65816 that was used to build the communicator. Indeed. John won't tell you that, because I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Tube ROM source code there. Complete with comments. Uh, Unlike the original. Have you found the uh, Fred Jim uh, Sheila source in there? In where, sorry? 
in the 1.2 Moss ROM, there yeah. should be the three hidden pages somewhere. Yes, they're full of names. In Moss 99. So you've got all the credits there. Those names are assembled into the ROM pages that are hidden by the Fred, Jim and Sheila I.O. hardware. Oh, okay. So um, they're, they're, that isn't visible on a real beep. Well, it is, but you have to try quite hard. People <laughs> have found it. I didn't realise that. Oh, okay. Yeah. There are three two five six byte pages which are where the um, I/O was, uh, but because you have to make a ROM, which is basically just the complete sixteen K, something has to be in there. So uh, we put the names of people in there who'd worked on the project. Oh. Out of interest, John, was it you who massively fired the source? Uh, what do you mean by that, Stu? Uh, converted it from you, Ed. Yes, I, I wrote the original assembler and then later um, they had two assemblers, UA and UASM. Uh, I then built a third one because neither of them were good enough. And then later on I, met, I built MASM, which is the one that put its macros, it ran on the second processor, put its macros in the host processor and things like that to, to use more memory. And then uh, uh, later on when I'd written the, written the ARM assembler, I then basically converted that back rather than rewriting the original to be a 6502 assembler, which is probably where the case sensitivity of names came in. Oh, the, the, the case sensitivity they found was actually in the ARM assembler. Yes, but the, um, you, you can, I wrote a, an ARM version of the 6502 assembler. Maybe they, maybe they haven't found that yet. Anyway. I don't think I ever had that. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, it's just one of those obvious things to do. Anyway, that would have put uh, case sensitivity. It's quite possible I put case sensitivity in when I wrote Madam. I can't remember. It's, the, it's, it's a pain in the arse to try and be case insensitive mm. when you're uh, matching, not surprisingly. You know, if you're doing table lookup for um, identifiers, case sensitive is much, much easier. Do I understand correctly the 650 Turbo stuff corresponded to a real piece of hardware? Yes, that's right. Um, I've got some photos of it somewhere. Um, I, I used to have one, but I uh, got, got rid of it 10 years ago. It, it was a board about twice the size of the um, normal 6502 second processor with 256K of RAM on it and some custom logic to sniff the bus to perform all of the features. And that existed, and people like John and Stuart used them because otherwise it didn't have enough memory to build the whole of the operating system. You'd run out of RAM on, on an ordinary machine, so that made things a lot bigger and more possible. And then, of course, later on, I think the uh, emulation of those machines was then possible, as we're seeing today, on the, on the ARM. And I know, Stuart, did you do the turbo version of the emulator? Yeah. Yeah, I thought you did, which is why we found all this on your machine. Hmm. The version 1.00 as well, uh, which is slightly more recent than the version included with RISCOS 2, which was 0 0.97. That, that is an odd, oddity because um, I have been going back through some emails where 0.99 was certainly actively being tested at the time I left and I had done 1.0 no I think the day I left and yet 0.07 was, was released with the systems that went out uh, six months later yeah well <laughs> Bill is it worth bringing up the version file inside the archive because that will actually show all of the additions made 
between 0.97 and version 1.00. Which directory was that in, if you can remind me briefly? It's not going to be in the wrong, is it? It's be new emulate. It's hiding at the bottom there, that's why I yeah. missed it. So, version 0.92 right at the top there. So, we've got the entire change history going back to version 0.92 of 65 host uh, right the way through and 0.979899. So this list down here is what's been changed. And somehow the 1.0 release that was made for the RISCOS welcome disks was substituted with 0.97 for the final release. Not my fault. <laughs> I think we can see whose fingerprints are on it. Look, the 0.97 says release to SQA. Yeah, it, um, 0.97 and 0.13 of ARFs were being very extensively tested. Um, so Jem Davis from CSD was doing a lot. Uh, Nick Van Sommer and um, another chap, uh, Phil Colmer. Yeah, there you go, 0.97. Oh, got the version there. Dig my way back up. When we came to build the Master Turbo, we yeah. needed to add some more Oswards to it because the Master MOS supported more Oswards, like um, for basic to do time dollars. And Os Oswords needed to be handled specially by the tube because there was no length byte or anything. Mm. Um, so adding those in, we went down to the drawing office to check out the source. And as, as, as you do, yet again, come up with floppy disks full of UAID. Well, you know, system three floppy disks full of UAID. Is there a system three? No, there isn't. And look, luckily, I had actually reverse engineered the tube boss one evening um, because it was a fun thing to do. And it was interesting that uh, mine was a lot better commented than the original. Commented by Roger, which made almost no comments. I'm guessing u was an earlier assembler predating Massam. Yes, it was. Yeah. And furthermore, it insisted on all its source files being called u XX, uh, if I remember rightly. The, the, there is a big lie in the tube sources which says source converted from UAID to MASM, meaning totally replaced. <laughs> it uses the same binary. Having had a turbo tube, I also had that disassembled, which is very minor tweaks to the main MOS. So those changes are conditionally in there as well. I had somebody ask me about the um, higher bytes of the execute and load addresses, actually, which you can see in that host FS window, because I believe in DFS, there was actually 18 bits in the file system for the load and execute addresses, which I guess must have been there because of the turbo uh, tube. Uh, I think other well, tubes had more. Anyway, 32016s, things like that would have needed. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Although 18 bits is a weird number for those, it's I guess. It's, all, it's an odd amount. But then you get places where they've been high bit extended, like you can see some of those um, load addresses are FFF. That's because they're in the IO processor, so IO mass them has to execute over in the IO processor. And that's how it controls where, where the thing is loaded. If it's FFFF something, it gets loaded in the beam. DFS must have had more than 18 bits because um, we got the idea for storing a five byte file timestamp from Panos. And Panos used DFS as one of its underlying file systems. Interesting as well, the list of companies on the credits list, or some of them slightly less obvious than others. 
So Hitachi, I'm guessing, the 6845 CRTC. Uh, and the ROMs. And the ROMs. Ferranti would have been the ULAs, at least in the Model B. Um, yeah. But Cleartone's an interesting one, aren't they? Weren't they a radio company? Alan Boothworth's company. Was ah. They were one of the manufacturers of the hardware. Right, okay. No, no, no. Click Clearton, weren't they in Wales? Yes. I don't know. AB Electronics were in Wales. They made a load of stuff for us. Hmm. Yeah, well, AB Electronics bought them. This was in the uh, hmm. this was in the all day thing last month. Uh, I can't cool. remember whose presentation it was, but two chaps from AB Electronics turned up to a demonstration of the. Uh, BBC Micro, and having seen it, they just on the strength of that, apparently they decided to buy Cleartone because they thought they were about the Cleartone were about to make a bunch of money. Yeah, I think that was in Chris Turn's presentation. What's the significance of Wilber the Wilberforce Road credit? That's where a bunch of people like Graham Tebby lived. Right. Okay. The Wilberforce Road is just off the Maddingley Road, just just not far from where I live. In fact. I think they, there were a bunch of them shared a house there. What's the ICL connection? Did ICL do some manufacturing? I don't know the answer to that one. But there was some sort of ICL tie-up for a while um, in the very early days. I think they might have provided some funding. Uh huh. Right back, you know, it went around about the time the BBC uh, contract was being put in place. I think the, uh, that might have, but I'm just stretching the limits of my memory there. You probably have to ask Herman. I remember there being a thread on Stardot about ICL making some of the early serial number beeps? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just found one. Serial number 131 says ICL on it. Okay. I think we should move on to the 8-bit stuff now. So thanks, Phil, for going through that demonstration. Thanks, Flibble, who's not online with us today, but he put all the work into that web page, which, again, I'm going to share in a minute. And thanks also to um, Paul and Stuart for finding these wonderful finds and also to um, John for contributing there as well. Uh, was there anything else, Phil, you thought we needed I to... I was just going to say, uh, yeah. to cap it all off, there are plenty of files uh, in the zip files to dig through. So I'm looking forward to seeing what people find in here that uh, isn't necessarily what we've shown and uh, what we share on Stardot. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share Peter's web page now. So hopefully, let's see. Yeah, you can see that. So the link at the top I'll paste into the Zoom chat. These are the downloads you need. So you know it's got the the RISCOS. RPCMU 3.71 Easy Start Bundle. You need a copy of AASM, the RISCOS 2 header files. And um, this is the, the download here that has, uh, as we received it, 6502 um, goodies. And so yeah, do have a look through that. And um, there's also a second file we received with basic related source code. So we'll, we'll get onto that in a minute. The next thing we've got is the 8-bit side of things. Hoglet has very kindly packaged up and uploaded to the Stardot page on GitHub some of the 8-bit stuff. So again, I'm going to put this link into chat now. Uh, this is live on GitHub. It went live at 3 o'clock. So there you go. So please grab these files, download them, fork them, distribute them. Though Dave is going to make some more updates to the disk images over the next few days. I should stress that all this work has been done in the last day and a half basically it's incredible the amount of work that both peter and dave have done so here's the os 1.2 assembly files a nice readme file here that explains the requirements you need a 6502 turbo obviously if you've got a bbc with pi tube direct that supports the turbo tube so that's required to assemble these MOS 1.2 sources. There are basically four variants inside the zip file. 
There's the original sources as we received them. There are a couple of tiny build bugs which have not been fixed in the original sources.zip file. Um, they have been fixed in the source folder. So if you look in the SRC folder, it should be ready to go. They've also been distributed on both ADFS disk images and DFS disk images. The README explains how it all works. So if you're using, say, a DFS and you've got dual drives or a GoTech, it's got the source code on the second disk. It's about 300k sources in total, the size of the sources in total. So that's spread across side one, side two of the second disk. The assembly tools, that's TurboMasm, is on drive naught of the first disk. And the working file space is on drive two. It creates a total of 30 temporary files whilst assembling. You know, you do need a full, I think it's 31 files on the DFS catalog. You need that free. So if we quickly swap to um, Steve, I don't know if Steve, yeah, Steve's in. Did you get anywhere with, in the last hour, looking at testing the turbo tube support in BM with the MOS file sources I've just emailed? Uh, I found it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> looks, I'm now looking at the pipe tube direct uh, source. And we, we talked about it on the, the all day thing last month. And what I took away from that was that the extra um, extra bits to the address applied specifically to the zero page indirect Y instruction. Uh, it looks like it applies to more than that um, because I've found a, a case where um, TurboMasm overwrites itself because it's using a uh, 65C12 direct uh, instruction, which is also obviously affected. Um, and in my implementation, it was not. It was using. Steve? That actually could be a mistake in the PyTube Direct implementation. Now that the real uh, Turbo Tube ROM has come to light, we've got a bit of a better understanding of how it was written and how it works. And it looks like it doesn't use any of the CMOS instructions at all. Uh, so I've, I've, I've got a plan to rework the stuff in PyTube Direct because the the tube the, the turbo tube ROM that PyTube Direct is using currently for the Turbo CoPro is is kind of something I dreamt up as a series of changes to the standard 6502 ROM, imagining how it might work based on very little information. Right. Okay. Well, the the, the tube client one may not use the CMOS instructions, but Turbo Mason definitely does. Uh, okay. Yeah, it does need to support the unindex, unindexed Y. Sorry, non-indexed indirect. So X, X does not use the address extension. This is the, the one where it does the indexing first and then the indirection. But the indirect Y and the indirect without Y, which is the new CMOS instruction, both do, yes? Yes. I think that's right, yeah. Okay, that's, that's interesting input then. Yeah, that sounds, sounds right. I may have misled you by saying it was only the IY, uh, but yeah, it, I think it, it's uh, IY okay. or just plain zero page indirect. Cool, thank you. If you want to see a picture of the, the real hardware, I've got one here. Yeah, you had one in my talk last time, didn't you? Sure. Um You've got what to hold up to the screen or to no, I've got a, your a camera JPEG of it. Um, so if I could yeah, sure. share my screen, I'll show you the couple of pictures I've got. I've just stopped my screen share. So you should be good to go. Is that working? Yeah. Yep. So I can just about see it uh, down here. It says extended 6502 second processor in a mixture of fonts yeah. on the board. So it's the same. It's the same size, is it, as an original six five zero two board? Yeah. Well, no. it was the same size box, but I think it was very different size board. Well, the box yeah. was presumably designed to be the same depth as the BBC Micro, so it looked nice when you stuck one next it's, to it's the. It's exactly other. the same physical case. Yeah, there's a, a picture of it in the in the case as well. 
I'm trying to understand what those two large chips at the front were. One of them looked like a tubular lie. And... That's 6502 processor. And tubular lie. Ah, okay. Can you zoom yeah, in? so that would be a, a, one of the tubular lays that actually worked, I guess. They were a bit touchy at the time, as I remember. That's why the lid's off. <laughs> Which one is yeah, I think you can see 256k by one RAMs there as well. So can we tell that it was an early UNA because it's the ceramic and gold packaging rather than plastic? Or was it, was it, did, it did they ever go plastic? I don't remember. Um, yeah, it is a 65C02 in there. It's the right way up here. Yeah, 65C02. PTE. Yeah. It's a bit more in focus, this picture. So you can see the rams. Three, five, six. And so presumably there's um, somebody who knows more about hardware than I do can identify what the rest of it's doing. But uh, there's got to be some, uh, lots of these bits of discrete logic that are doing all the um, bus sniffing and page flipping, aren't they? Did we see a circuit diagram of this? Because that obviously would be a better starting point to work out um, what it's going for. That would be nice, but I don't have one. But yeah, I mean, presumably, is this, is this a multi-layer board or is it only two? If it's two, presumably it could be reverse engineered if we can't guess at it. But we might, um, we might be able to get something that works without that. It's probably a lot easier to start with the uh, ARM version of the emulator, isn't it? No, because it's inaccurate. Oh. <laughs> as, as, as I found out, um, because um, Mark Colton had actually written a Z80 assembler using the turbo tube for the Cambridge computer development of the Z88. And we had to go around to Mark's house once because Paul Bond's turbo tube had died. And I think Paul suggested, well, we could use this... Um, Turbo Masm on the um, Turbo Emulator, but it didn't work. So we, we went round and um, discovered that, un unlike um, Turmasm, which is a correctly written program, it, ha it has a bite in the header to say it's a turbo program. The MOS sets up page three correctly, everything's good. Um, Mark's one poked the turbo register directly so that it could swap between. Um, standard 16-bit addressing modes and turbo addressing modes. So he, he had some routines which um, didn't expect turbo addressing. I think it just extended the symbol table processing so that it could be turboed. And um, he, he, the original emulation didn't understand that the turbo register was actually memory backed so that it, whilst the turbo register use in the MOS appeared right only, you could do things like rotate that byte and it would shift a note into the turbo active bit, disabling the turbo but preserving the old state. And then you could rotate it left again, taking it out of me the memory backing, back into the turbo register. The pervert. I was just about to say pervert. So, so, so we spent a while fixing the emulator so that it worked with Mark's assembler, but we don't have a copy of that. Okay, well, there it is for what it's worth. Mm. All right, thanks, Paul. So there we go. We got the OS ROM source there as we covered in a variety of flavors. Paul, as he mentioned, I think in his last talk, the basic one to eight that was distributed with the B plus and the master one to eight that gave you 64K of memory to um, operate basic in. Um, the sources have been located for that. 
again, Hoglet has packaged them in a variety of flavors, you know, original sauce or in BBC disc images, and also the unmodified sauce. Um, there was a little corruption with, with one of the files, um, Bass 10. Dave was able to disassemble the whole thing and rebuild it. And now if you assemble the versions inside, you know, the source directory or the DFS directory, they will 100% match the original binary for the Bass 1 to 8 as distributed. So again, thanks again to Dave for all the work putting this together. Uh, and also Paul for submitting it in the first place. I think this is, it's also the source code is for version 1.11. I think we are only familiar with a 1.10. So it looks as if we've got a slightly later uh, version there. So Paul, I don't know if you've got any other comments about the, the basic one to eight uh, uh, package, but it's obviously a great discovery having the source and thanks for keeping hold of all these discs whilst, you know, Acorn the company didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um... I'm very pleased to be with to be able to sort of share that. It was one of the later projects that we in the Acorn Soft Languages group did just before we uh, got asked to drop everything and do RISCOS. Um, but uh, it really came out of the fact that uh, we'd been to a number of shows before and people had come to me and sort of said, you know what's the difference between the BBC Micro and the and the B Plus, and you could explain you had more memory for your basic programs, and everybody liked that. But when the B Plus One Two Eight was being created, um, I had conversations with I think it was David Bell and um, uh, uh, some of the people in the marketing group who kind of didn't realise that adding the extra sideways RAM wasn't going to give BASIC any more space. And at this moment of, you know, light bulb overhead, uh, where I realized we could turn the whole thing on inside out and on, and on its head, um, and uh, got Tony Thompson to uh, actually have a go at doing it. So we took another trip down to the uh, drawing office and lifted the source code of BASIC and had all those same headaches that Stuart's talked about about which assembler it was written in. Um, and Sam, that's uh, the nickname that Tony had, um, bless him, really cracked on through it and did an amazing job to produce Baz128 in fairly short period of time. Um, Sophie Wilson, who was Roger at the time, of course, said uh, a couple of choice words about this project. She said it's impossible. Um, and I think suicide was mentioned as another uh, adjective that was apl applied to it, but Tony did it anyway. Um, so, um, you know, all, all credit to him. And um, secondly, because of the way it works to redirect everything, I don't know, we seem to have, either I dreamt that there was a turbo version of BASIC, because nobody else seems to rem remember it existing, um, or it's lost. Um, but if anyone wanted to build it, Baz128 is a great place to start because it's got all the places where it needs to access user memory as opposed to code memory separated because the code would run in, in the downstairs memory in, in the normal RAM of the B. That's where the basic image would be, the, the interpreter image but your user program and all its data lives across four banks of sideways ROM, each of 16K, giving you the 64K apparently flat workspace. But because Tony went in and intercepted every one of the accesses where the interpreter goes and pulls stuff from um, your program or, or the workspace, that's just the set of intercepts that you need for going and making it to uh, page the um, turbo register. So there's a mad idea for somebody to have a go at. How the hell did um, Pling or um, Peak Poke type of things work in that? Or if you wanted to read the write to screen memory? Uh, yes. You couldn't write to screen memory because uh, the interpreter was living where the screen memory was. 
But anyway, we'd have to take you out and keel haul you if you started poking screen memory, because that was definitely verboten. Um, but yeah, but that made it fun. I know. S seriously, though, the, the because the interpreter sat at uh, sat at um, page and lived between page and eight thousand in normal memory, the screen memory had to be in shadow mode mm. in order for you to um, be able to. Uh, run the interpreter and then all your user basic program was in sideways ROM so none of these three things could really see each other very easily. We'll move on to some of the other versions of basic that were supplied in the bundle from Paul labeled CMOS and DMOS basic let's look at CMOS basic upon initial inspection we thought these were just indeterminate versions of basic one we thought was a development version of basic for another one a development version of basic 4.32 I think something like that with some further digging dave realized that if you remove this line i think and i'm sure dave can correct me if i'm wrong or you comment it out then when you generate the binary from the assembled sources it's the same basic that was distributed with all masters with the original mos 3.2 rom so we've actually got the full source code for the bbc masters basic 4 which is again phenomenal what does that instruction do dave's linked here in the readme it looks like the dim fix talked about here i did the following check in the multiply upper dimension by lower dimension routine oh and it's to avoid memory corruption is that let me see if i can just um yeah that does make some sense i've just increased it so hopefully that's more readable anyway uh, again, you know, we encourage everybody to have a look at these builds. At about one o'clock in the morning last night, Kevin Edwards very kindly recorded using the BM emulator an assembly of the DFS bundle that um, Dave Banks put together. So this takes about six minutes, so we can we can chat a little about this as we, as um, uh, as it's going on. We'll leave this running in the background. Yeah, and um, using Mazum on both halves. Oh, that's what sorry that's Mazum, yeah 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 i should also comment and um, mention that also when i need to the final thing i was going to show was revisit the original 6502 goodies archive that also contains the source code for Mazum, the assembler it includes the source code for tube rom the rom inside the tube and there's another folder of i think it's a backup of a library path from a from a winchester that mm -hmm. seems to con we've only had a quick look but it seems to contain several internal acorn versions of roms that we haven't seen before or possibly later versions i'll quickly flash those up at the end of this but again we just encourage people to you know to, to dig through it all let us know what you find Ed sent me something he wanted me to flag about a hardware switch. I'll need to see where that message is, but we'll leave that going in the background. It was a chat about Econet this morning. Yeah. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, there is what appears to be DNFS source code in the MU6502 directory. Some of you may find that quite interesting the final version of basic here is the acon demos basic you know we I should stress we're still looking into this dave's made some initial comments here It's got a copyright string 1985 versions 04, but it doesn't match any known release of 6502 Basic. It appears to be a development version prior to Basic 4.3. During this session, Kevin Edwards has been doing some further digging. He's just sent me this. R.A. Sack. Yes. Do you remember Professor Sack, Stuart? Oh, yeah. That, that, that's why, 
one of, one of the differences I've noticed between the two, the CMOS one only mentions Roger at the end. Yeah. Whereas the Demos one has Prof Sachs routines in it. That's right. I remember now. I, I, I couldn't remember what I think it was, but seeing that as, as yeah, we have this guy called Professor in um, to us at Acorn Soft, and the letter landed on my desk. Um, and he said, I've uh, made a, a few small improvements to. Um, was it the floating point routines? Yeah, it was. Yeah, and um, he'd, uh, we thought, oh, oh no, another crackpot. But um, actually, he came along and proved it, and they were super, weren't they? It was speed and accuracy, mostly in the transcendental stuff. Yeah, I think, I think yeah was, transcendentals and the trigonometrics. Yeah, using continued fractions. Yeah, one and of the things he he did was to um the the originals used to uh, clamp for uh, values very close to zero and things like that which basically meant if you were in that region you got horrible discontinuities and basically they got rid of that kind of stuff so they didn't do clamping anymore right and that made the um the you know signs of very small angles and things like that much more accurate in the in the source directory, there is actually an original comments file mm. that that has quite a long list of changes and the kind of rationale behind them. So is this in a, Demos, David? Is this yeah. in Demos? Yeah. So if I extract, D yeah, Demos. in GitHub, you can see it in GitHub. You don't need to. Oh right, that. okay. So if you go into the source directory, I just wanted to flag also Kevin's comment about. He noticed that RE SAC appears in the master compact. Yeah, I think DMOS Wrong. is basic 4.1, as you say, uh, in the compact, because there was, there's, I think, three versions of basic 4 before 4.32. There was basic 4, basic 4.0, basic 4.1, basic 4.3.0, and basic 4.3.2. Uh, and if my camera's working, I've got basic 4.1 on the screen, which is the Roger Wilson and Ave Sack one. Okay, because Kevin, I think, did compare, compare Demos to the Master Compact binary, and it is a li it's a little bit different. I think some extra spaces at the end, or something is or isn't, the, the Wilson is or isn't truncated. So it, it looks as if it could be a an early ver a slightly early version of the master compact basic so right let me find this go to github demos basic source and comment so, so this is this is an original file listing a whole bunch of detailed changes so i i think a lot of these are known but there's probably some more detail here uh than we've seen before I mean, it goes on and on and on. There's about 15 or 20 items. I'm going to swap back to the file manager and have a look at 6502 goodies. So obviously the bulk of the, the MU6502 is what Phil demonstrated at the beginning of the, the presentation. So that contains everything all the host OS sources, as well as the DNFS sources, the OS 1.2 sources and the tube OS sources. When you say tube OS sources, that's a very heavily hacked version for the emulator. And it's not the actual tube OS sources, which is one level up. Yes, that's what I was going to, I was going to come on yeah. to that. So yeah, so we've also got the, oh, I've gone a bit too... Uh, let me go in. Inside BBC Winnie, we've got the tube ROM sources, yeah? So that assembles, I think, is it version 1.20 of the tube? 1.1 1 .1 is the known public tube OS release, and it seems as if you've carried on working on it. I don't think we've seen an OS 1.2 1, 1 tube ROM before. You must have been on the Master Turbo. No, the Master Turbo was identical to 1.1 1 .1 with the change to the startup banner and uh, three Osword 
lengths. There was no other difference. Brilliant. So yeah, it looks like another, you know, another discovery. Does that sound about right, Stuart, then? Or, uh... Yeah, the, well, the, there is a comment in there saying for, first um, version for MNG, which I presume is Martin Gilbert. Yeah, um, the, the comment I noticed in the source is fixing the bug in star go, where hmm. if you did star goal, uh, G-O-A-D, it would try to jump to the address A-D rather than it being parsed as the command yeah. G-O-A-D. Yeah. And that was a, a bug picked up about 15 years ago when um, uh, John Cortink was building, uh, doing the uh, the Rico 6502. Where's this comment contained, Jonathan? Do you know which file? Tosso one. Right. So first version for MNG, 24th of October, 85, 1.1. Second, then, yeah. SKS, that's Stuart, 16th of January, 87. So that's over a year later. And it's got the, it's got the differences here. Can I, I, yeah, I'll just zoom them in. So it's the, uh, so it's clearer. We've got Brian reference there as well. Mm -hmm. Brian Coburn. And as Stuart said, MNG, that's Martin Gilbert who uh, was the chief designer for the master. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that that one got, got out because I, I thought that was just for Martin's prototyping. But it can't have been, can it? Because the master came out late 86. But when did Master Turbo come out? I, th I thought that was 87. Anyway, let's have a look. So there's there's the tube ROM sources. There's the sources for Mazen. And finally, in the library directory, there's all sorts of stuff in there. A lot of it we don't recognize. Stuart, is there anything in particular you'd flag here you think we should have a... I, th I think the high basic is a 4.32. Um, there's versions of high edit which are useful. Um, um, ADT, I think, is the Advanced Disk Toolkit ROM. Yeah. Um, someone mentioned that they got different versions of the Basic Editor, and they found one called Our Basic Editor. Now, yeah. I, I, was, I, I was quite prone to um, just hacking people's ROMs, so if you had the Basic Editor, I called it Our Basic Editor dis to distinguish it. I, ah, I, I see. I seem to remember DJD walked in behind me one day, and I had a, a screen full of... Um, well, binary in edit, hacking something like that. And he um, turns to Paul and says, what's Stuart doing? Oh, he's just hacking the 6502. <laughs> no, that's good. That's useful to know. Is there anything with an hour prefix? It's likely to be a, an SKS hack, yeah? yeah. It's, it's like if you find it, anything called retarded disk toolkit, it just fits the same. <laughs> That'll be the opposite of the advanced disk toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we did have one question in from Stuart Badger. How, how sweary is the source? Um, I don't know if anybody else has looked at it um, in detail. Sadly not. I, th I think BL Visasm is a decompiler for BL code for, from Pascal. Um, things you'll never have seen before is, um, I think high check is... Um, the Pascal syntax checker written by Richard Manby so that we didn't have to run the compiler on the compiler, which took forever. You could just do a fast parse of it. Um, there's... What were you doing with Pascal? <laughs> what was I doing with Pascal? <laughs> what well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't remember much Pascal stuff on the Beebs. There was a Pascal compiler and editor done by a couple of guys. Yeah. It was published by Acorn Soft on two ROMs. It was one of my jobs to get that out the door. It was written by uh, Ben and Lionel, hence the BL code for the in name of the intermediate code. So that BL disasm there is, is to do with that. 
Um, and it's essentially you had um, a version of the editor and the runtime system in one of the ROMs and the compiler in the other one. So you've got high pass there. That's going to be the Pascal, one of the Pascal ROMs, isn't it? Well, com 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 assembled for... Um, assembled for B1000 yeah. on the tube, yeah. yeah. And that editor popped up later in the master, didn't it? Does it stand the standard star edit thing? That's right. Yeah. Had it been released previously as part of anything, or was it as part of Pascal? But only as part of Pascal. But that that was that was one of the things I took under my wing when when we got it from Ben and Lai. So we put did that for the master and CMOSified it and highified it and uh, did quite a bit of work doing. As, as I mentioned the other day, that um, we did things like add adding five byte timestamps to edit um, b before Arthur came out, just so we could actually work on the same files from, from one system or the other. Is there any relationship between that editor and twin? None. No. Okay. Uh, twin was ro a, a Roger production, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was, and it was originally written um, in, I'm not sure if he originally wrote it in 32016 or he originally wrote it in ARM running on a 30, on an ARM emulator on a 32016. It was, a, it was a, an amusing concept, but it actually worked. Mm. ARM emulators on a 32016, luxury. We only had it on a 6502. Yeah, I know. Well, I wrote that. <laughs> Right, just had some comments in. Let's have a look. Stuart, who asked the questions about, is it sweary? He's looked at MUDNFS. He's just grepped it and he says it's a little bit sweary. DOS 06, ensure that a reset in the middle doesn't F things up. <laughs> Where's Hugo? Yeah, that, that'll be go. Hugo's doing. <laughs> oh, this I'm here, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Oi, big nose, they're after your, your, your code. I'm just going to paste it into Notepad Plus. Add a few asterisks, and here we go. We're all ready to go. Right. <laughs> Hugo? <laughs> what? I've no idea if that was anything to do with me. <laughs> Probably Brian, then. It could have been me. Is this the source of DFS, as in yep. 6502 DFS? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, it might have been me making uh, ordinary DFS work on the tube then, yes. This is the combined bastardised DNFS ROM, if you remember that. Yeah, that was me and Brian, and Jez to an extent, yeah. doing DNFS. Um, yeah. Well, it is quite important to make sure there's a tube, otherwise things might go wrong later, right? Hence the uh, emphasis. I'm just going to bring up something the Big Ed raised prior to this session um, i've got a feeling it might have been addressed uh, but actually I'll, what i'll do is i'll summon dave, dave banks hoglet if, if you're there i think you can probably do a better job than i kind of um explaining this i think paul talked about this earlier so one thing we didn't uh get just from you know guessing how it might work was the presence of this hardware enable register uh, that was actually more than just one bit uh, so that you could you know, re record the previous state of enabledness uh, by using a shift and then restore it back again just by using a shift the other way. So this, this isn't implemented yet in the PyTube Direct emulation. So in the PyTube Direct emulation, it's on all the time. Which I think for you know, ter termasm is fine because it doesn't hack it. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it runs well. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to share are some things that Nigel Perno flagged a week or two back when we first received the sources. I'm just bringing up the library directory. So our basic editor, basic editor 2, spelt T-W-O, 1.50, high edit, possibly high Pascal. So again, we'd encourage anyone to have a look at these and 
um, and flag any anything you think that's a, a, of interest. I just put in there, I can see one, um, Quick. Quick was a text editor written by Mark Coulton, which were, had the facility to have a, an external list of files so you could um, do search through files. So I, I think you'll notice in the 6502 sources I've added, um, I think it's in a plus directory. There's a list of files so you can whiz up and down them. Yeah, just obviously it's a binary, but <laughs> so it's gobbledygook, but at the header you can see, yep, quick copyright 1984 Mark Colton, who obviously wrote view. Just to summarize, you can grab everything with the source code for 65 host tube turbo and the BBC MOS. That's got everything in it. And of course the GitHub, Stardock GitHub has got some of the 8-bit content at the moment that's been packaged up nicely. And hopefully, you know, over the next few days, weeks, we can add to that and present the remainder of what's in the, you know, this bundle. All that's left to do is thanks Stuart and Paul, not only keeping hold of these uh, artifacts for all these years, but being willing to share them, you know, archive them and share them with the community so we can document them. It's going to help the emulator authors. It's going to help the hardware developers, all sorts. And thanks especially to Dave Banks, who's packaged everything up, Peter, for testing and writing this whole assembly process. If there's anybody else out there that's sitting on old source code, you know, please don't bin it. If you've got floppies, let's try and get them read in before they, you know, they finally die and we'll, you know, we'll make sure they get shared and used in the future. That's it. I just wanted to say well done to the guys who managed to um, reassemble the missing bits of Baz128. I think that was an amazing job in a very short period of time.